this video lecture is going to help you actively read sections of The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, specifically, you're going to pay attention to two vocabulary words that will be on your test Thursday if you're in a Tuesday, Thursday class or Friday if you're in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class over the fellow feather pillow that we'll start um, discussing in class or through a series of other video lectures. So we're looking at The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, one of his most famous pieces of work. And so um, below this video lecture, I have also included a link to an animated um, version of this um, narrative poem that you're welcome to uh, review. So, um, what I write here on my notes is what you want to write in your book on your, um, in your volume one text. And then you're going to take pictures of those notes and you're going to send those to me. So that's the first thing that I want you to write is that this is a narrative poem, right? And we know that the word narrative means to narrate, and to narrate means to tell a story. So the Raven is an example of Gothic literature, just like the fellow pillow is. And so the characteristics of Gothic literature, um, you've already closely read and annotated in another, in a previous video lecture but that's on page 33 in your book as well. So um, Gothic literature, we're gonna take some notes over here just as a review. So Gothic literature has um, five characteristics. There is a bleak, remote setting. Bleak, right? It's desolate, it's cold, it's empty. Remote, it's um, set off by itself. Another uh, characteristic of Gothic literature is that characters are in torment. torment, they're in suffering. And clearly, um, you'll see that in the text of the narration. We also have plots with supernatural occurrences. Super means above, beyond, natural. So things happen that aren't natural. We have a speaking raven here in this narrative poem. That is not natural. That is not natural, right? Um, uh, we do not have speaking birds. Of course, it's an example of personification, but. Okay, so another characteristic of Gothic literature is that we have dramatic and descriptive language. And we certainly observed that when we were looking at the sample uh, sentences, the sample compound sentences from the fall of the House of Usher. And then a final characteristic of Gothic literature is that there is a gloomy mood, right? And mood is um, created through the setting description. We have also symbolism through repeated images. 
So I'll move that up so that you can see that. So we have symbolism through uh, repeated <clears throat> images. In this um, narrative poem, the raven is a symbol of the yearning, that longing for Lenore by the narrator. We could also, um, in some literature reviews that I've read, also talks about how the raven might be a symbol of the narrator's grief. So not just the longing for Lenore, the girlfriend that has been lost, but the grief because she is dead. Now, obviously, if we had time to engage in a whole group conversation about this text, it would be interesting to see what your ideas would be, but we just don't have that time. So remember, your notes need to look like my notes, and um, this is how you're going to um, get a homework grade. Uh, should be an easy 100. Um, so, and then you're just going to take pictures and you're going to send these to me via Google Classroom. Alrighty, so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a few um, stanzas of this narrative poem um, because on your test um, this week, you're going to um, need to show that you know what entreating means here on page 104 and then um, another word that we'll look at on page 105. Now, the raven is such a great uh, piece of narrative poetry because it just sounds so good when you read it, right? And so one of my most favorite words is mellifluous, mellifluous, mellifluous. And mellifluous means that it just sounds good. In my classroom, I have this um, word below the disposition target of being a good listener because we do listen to things that sound good to us um, that are mellifluous. Okay, so what I annotate here, you want to annotate on your text. So I'm just kind of doing a think aloud with you, um, helping you closely read sections of this text. Okay, so once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Doesn't that sound good, right? So what we have is we do have some repetition, this rapping rapping, we do have some rhyme with tapping, tapping, right? So I want you to just write down that literary technique of uh, repetition. We do see, we do have uh, some rhyming, which helps create that nice mellifluous effect. It just sounds good. I am particularly um, drawn to the word tapping because it is an example of onomatopoeia, right? And that's where words sound like what they mean. Words sound like what they mean, like roar and ouch, right? Those are all examples of onomatopoeia. 
I also am drawn to the alliteration that we have in this opening stanza, alliteration. Wild, weak, weary, right? That consonant sound that's repeated at the beginning. And then we also have alliteration here, nearly napping, that end, that consonant sound at the beginning. And then of course, what we also have here, we are telling a story, so we do get the introduction of our characters. So our characters here, right, is I, right? We have that first person narrator. And then we have this visitor who's knocking on the door. And right now it's an unknown visitor. So that kind of brings some sense of um, mystery to the situation. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December. So here, right, we have that first element of Gothic literature. So we're just gonna label that number one to match this number one. And of course, bleak, right, means barren. It's empty, right? There's nothing there. And of course, in December, it's cold. Trees have no leaves. The grass is um, not growing. And each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly, I wish the morrow. Of course, that is an alternate word for tomorrow. Vainly, I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Of course, we see this um, superscript one that tells us to go here to the bottom. And surcease means end. I love the alliteration here, right? So he's wanting to end his sorrow by reading Sorrow for the Lost Lenore. And so here's uh, another character in our narrative. And she's uh, the love of the narrator. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here evermore, nameless here evermore. She no longer can be called because she is dead, right? We have lovely alliteration there. All right, let's go to the third stanza. Oh, we also have some alliteration here. Lost Lenore. Now you'll notice, I'm going to draw your attention here to evermore. That is a repeated uh, word uh, throughout the passage that kind of helps us uh, with some um, interpretation of symbolism and theme. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. So what I am drawn to here in this third stanza is this word wrestling, very precise language. We have imagery here of the purple curtain uh, filled me with fantastic terrors, right? So the moving of the curtain made our narrator frightened um, so that now to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, right? So he's nervous about this 
um, rapping at his chamber door. And so he starts talking to himself. We know he's talking to himself. We've got quotation marks here. And he's saying, ah, oh, oh, it's just, it's just a visitor. Uh, nothing, nothing more is going on here. This isn't um, that big of a deal. So the word entreating is the word that you need to know the definition to on your test this week. And entreating is a great word and it sounds so nicely next to the word entrance. And entreating means uh, sincerely begging. You know, tap, 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 rap, 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 you know, knock, knock, knock. There's a persistence there, uh, but there's no rudeness. There's no urgency. It's just a very confident knock, um, sincerely begging. Um, this visitor wants our narrator to open the door. Um, and again, we're going to see this repetition of this final line repeated. Okay, let's go to page 105 and let's annotate um, a little bit here. Again, we're looking um, closely at just parts of this text um, to prepare you for um, certain sections of your test on Thursday. So we're gonna look at one, two, three, this fourth stanza, right? This is a stanza. That's what we call a group of lines in a poem. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there and nothing more. So the first thing I wanna draw your attention to is just the semicolon here, because we've been studying syntax, right? And so what does a semicolon do, right? It joins complete sentences, right? Now, the language is quite dramatic here uh, because we kind of have an inversion of our um, sentence structure. This is pretty state straightforward. Presently, my soul grew stronger, right? My soul is your subject. Grew is your verb, right? So that's clearly a complete sentence. But then we get over here and we have like an introductory adverbial um, phrase, hesitating then no longer, sir, said I or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. So here is where we have um, our verb and then our subject. So this is a very uh, complex compound sentence, but I want to draw your attention to that semicolon. And we know that Edgar Allan Poe enjoys the semicolon. And then we see another semicolon there. So here is the vocabulary word implore that you need to know. And then it means urgently beg. So entreating is begging, but in a persistent, sincere, respectful way. Implore is there's a little bit more urgency there. So the narrator is saying to whomever is on the other side of the door, knocking, um, wanting entrance into his bedroom, that, um, He's, he's a little nervous, and so he's trying to be very polite, and um, 
he's like, oh, forgive me for having you wait so long to uh, gain entrance here. But, uh, you know, I was napping and uh, you were you were rapping so gently that I really uh, didn't hear you that, that well. So please, please, please uh, forgive me, right? And then of course, um, he opens the door and there's nothing there, right? Da, 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 da. So um, again, that kind of contributes to uh, that mysterious, gloomy, mood. Uh, what else do I want to draw your attention to? I just want you to put no one is there. And uh, again, we've got the onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia, right? Those sound words. A couple of things that I want to um, ask you to annotate here on this page is how we do have this repetition of that last line in stanzas five, six, and seven. And then we start to see never more repeated, um, which is an, a word that's often quoted with the raven. Now, that's all that you're going to annotate for the raven. Um, again, you need to know what the word implore means, and you need to know what the word entreating means for your test. And then for your homework um, assignment uh, for this video lecture, you're going to take a picture of your annotated notes, just of these two pages, and you're going to upload that in Google Classroom. Please make sure that you refer to the rubric so that you get the grade that you want for this homework assignment.